In early 2019, I ran a campaign for the tabletop miniatures game, Necromunda. There were nearly two dozen people willing to play the campaign at the start. As a coordinator, it was quite intimidating. But by the time the campaign wound down two months later, we were down to just a few exhausted gang leaders. The campaign had hemorrhaged active players. Nonetheless, this initial outing in the world of mini wargaming campaigns whet my appetite for more of that narrative campaign format. In late 2019, I played in my first campaign of Frostgrave, this time with a smaller group of dedicated and enthusiastic friends. With just the five people, give or take a couple depending on availability, we played through a custom set of narrative scenarios over nearly three months. The campaign finished strong and I remember it fondly. In 2021, Starling Badger Studios put out a skirmish size miniature agnostic tabletop campaign system called Rain in Hell. As soon as I heard about it, I decided I wanted to play it. Partly because of the unique theme, and partly because it was released on my birthday. And that made it feel like it was made just for me. The system is tight, the matches are terse, and the rules are easy to pick up. Much has been said and much will be said about the rules, about the activation system specifically, but today I would like to talk about Rain and Hell's true main event, the campaign. I want to talk about it because there are a number of interesting things going on in the system's campaign that make it as good as it is. And just generally speaking, I do not think there is enough discourse around what makes for a good miniature war games campaign. I won't be touching on the crunchy specifics of the rules on this video, nor will I be discussing the lore. I want to deal mainly with the highs and lows of the structured narrative campaign. I want to talk about what works and what doesn't, and the mechanics that facilitate these things. My opinions in this video will be colored by the time I spent mediating and playing in previous campaigns, both for Necromunda and for Frostgrave. Along with a few other systems that technically have rules for campaigns that were there but were not quite as robust. We will be taking a look at how a Rain in Hell campaign flows and how it feels. But to get as good a grasp on these things as possible, I needed to actually play a campaign in the first place. Tabletop miniature campaigns are a big commitment. They can be a pain to set up if the stars aren't aligned for it, and it can take a few games before they get, you know, interesting. Add to that the number of games I wanted to clock in within the small time frame I had allowed myself, and I got myself a recipe for nobody wanting to play with me. As such, I decided to run the campaign solo. Now, there are drawbacks to playing mini war games with yourself, but in this instance, for this purpose, I feel the pros greatly outweigh the cons. I will leave a short list up here if you want to read it over. This is a big subject and something I would like to discuss another time. What I would like to quickly touch on is the act of playing solo in general. It's been a growing trend these past few years, not quite mainstream yet, but getting there. If the idea of playing solo appeals to you in any way, let me just quickly recommend Rangers of Shadowdeep for a great solo miniatures wargaming campaign. Easily one of the best I've had with the medium in general. I'll put some links in the description. To prepare for the campaign, I wanted at least four cabals, which are Rain and Hell's roving demonic cliques whose emergent stories create the campaign's narrative. I wanted them to round robin each other for an even distribution of challenge, and four seemed like a reasonable number to do that with. Three goes of a complete round robin totaling 18 games, nine matches for each cabal, to be done over five or so days. That sounds reasonable, right? Since the system is model agnostic, I am free to use whatever vaguely demonic models I would like for the campaign. I had a couple of previously done warbands that could cover for two of the cabals, but I also needed to paint up an entirely new set of models made to purpose for the system to get a more informed take on the experience as a whole. So for the third cabal, I 3D printed a batch of models from artist Duncan Shadow, whose work I'd been keeping an eye on for ages. These are his free models on Thingiverse, but given how they came out, I am likely to start throwing money at him soon. The fourth and last cabal was 3D printed from models from another artist, Schlossbauer, who puts a criminal amount of their work up for free on Thingiverse. I am currently on their Patreon, I love the work, especially on the fleshier beasties like these ones. I compose and paint up the initial seven models for each cabal with the intent of filling them in with other models from my collection as they progress. 
Once finished, I give them all very simple backgrounds appropriate to the lore to try and set the mood before the dice start rolling. From the inky depths of nothing come the Void Rogues, affiliated with the philosophy of the empty and led by the doting Mother Tail, along with the decidedly less doting Void Demon, Helmet. The Panopticon represent the crazed philosophy of the demented and are herded by the zealot known as the Woe Strider. Abaya, the large floating serpent of flesh and eyes, is often seen in their ranks. Soul transfers are big business, and the Viridian demons of Fungicorp brokers are keen to capitalize on Hell's latest and greatest power vacuum. They are led by the enterprising schemer, Monty, along with his talisman, Lunatic Leo. Hell's Byzantine bureaucracy is never without its enforcers, and the King's Court look to re-establish some form of order in all the recent chaos, led by the Duke and tailed by his brutal executioner, Gallant. Once my cabals are ready, I lay out a round robin for them, gather up all of my tools, and I finally get to go to hell. Hey there. So I've just gotten back from work and I've finished my first game of Rain and Hell. I'm going to be doing the campaign, and every day I'm going to stand, well, sit, in front of this camera and talk about my feelings on it very briefly. Today was just the first game, so I don't got much to say yet. I do like the system, so far. I do like the little things it does. We'll get into it more as we go on. So, that is day number one. Rain and Hell is a skirmish size, alternating activation, low numbers, high lethality campaign system with a focus on pushing your luck across five densely packed turns of play. The game revolves around its unique activation system which works off 12-sided dice, one for each demon. I had zero d12s on hand, and since I was rolling for two cabals at a time, I had to get the whole bunch. If this game were a living creature, the initiative draft these d12s make would be its spinal column. Every other system is built around and informed by the initiative draft. And just like in real life, if you accidentally knock the spinal column's vertebrae out of place, you are in for a bad time. Each d12 corresponds to a single demon, any demon. And at the top of each round, each player rolls all their d12s, and then does a little counting game, lining them up in descending order. Activations start with the player with the highest number. If they're tied at top place, usually at 12, they roll off with d6s to decide who goes first. But if they tie again in the middle, it simply goes to the person who hasn't activated yet. Each time a player takes one of the turns, they will take one of those dice and they will assign it to a demon, usually to try and make it murder another demon. Once a demon has gone and had a dice assigned to them, it can no longer activate for the round. When a demon is slain, you have to take one of the unused dice off the track. This happens regardless of whether the demon has gone or not. Like in other alternating systems, slaying a demon that has not yet activated effectively removes what would have been its turn. Unlike other systems, slaying a demon that has already activated deprives the rest of their cabal with what would have been a completely fresh activation. Normally, an alternating activation scheme forces you to consider opponents that have not yet activated, as taking them out stops them from hurting you in the first place. Rain in Hell's system also incentivizes attacking demons that have already activated, because it does not just give you the opportunity to attack a relatively helpless foe, it also gives you a chance to remove another activation down the initiative track. This makes Rain in Hell's combat feel far more reactive than your usual tabletop skirmish. Instead of just encouraging you to think ahead and identify the highest level threat you can reasonably eliminate, it will also encourage you to just lash out, retaliate, to pile everything into that one cheeky demon who skirmished halfway across the board to get at your leader. The initiative system is making sure the player controlling the demons always has a chance to get some form of reward for the call they've made in that instant. If not through a slain enemy, then through lighter damage, the inflicting of demonic flesh wounds, and of course, the rolling of tiny dice. The combat rolling in Rain and Hell works on contested rolls of multiple six-sided dice. A demon's combat score decides the number of dice you roll, a representation of the demon's overall ability to murder. When a demon attacks another demon, they first compare combat scores. 
If the attacker finds that they are equal to the defender, they will do damage of every roll of a 3 or better. If the defender turns out to be the better fighter, the attacker is overcome with feelings of inadequacy and will only ever hit on rolls of 4 or better. And finally, if the attacker finds that they have the higher combat score, it means they will be hitting on 2 or better. The defender is then given an opportunity to defend themselves, rolling their combat score in dice, but only ever succeeding on those rare 6 dot box scores. If you are familiar with the mass rolling of d6s, these numbers may seem overly generous, to the point of being deterministic. But as any Space Marine player will tell you, hitting on 4s means you won't hit, hitting on 3s means you will hit a third of the time, and hitting on 2s is the best way to make sure you roll a bunch of 1s. This power level based combat means that Rain and Hell's fighty interactions are knowable to either player at a glance, but unpredictable in execution. This is a turn of phrase that I have quoted directly from the developers, it's something they use to describe their initiative system. I think it is a good design philosophy that they have also applied to the rest of the game. Players have all this combat information neatly categorized for them through the game's many different kinds of demons. The demonic archetypes are arranged in evolutionary levels, starting from the readily available lesser demons, to the mid-campaign greater demons, and the late-game superior demons. Each demonic type has its own stat line and special ability. Mechanically, it means certain demons are good at certain combat roles. For example, slaughter fiends are better at reactive or extended combat, while spine demons are much better on the initial charge. Despite the game being very concerned with direct combat, not all of the demonic types lead into just doing murder. Armored and corpulent demons move slower but are far more difficult to kill. The Zippy Tentacle Beast penalizes all enemy demons within an inch of it, one of the few instances of the game indulging in debuffs. This makes the Tentacle Beast easily the hottest target on the board. They give all your demons a minus one to combat so you want them to die immediately. And then finally you have the Flying Mephit, which while near useless in a fight, can easily traverse over other models and terrain. The selection of lesser demons makes up about 4 to 6 slots of your Cabal. Rounding this up to 6 or 8 will be your leader, and their right hand demon, the Devout. The leader represents the Cabal's demonic mob boss, and at the start is given the most layers of customization to play with. You can choose your leader stat line and special ability from a selection of three types, then further tune them with the leader specific essence and a leader specific relic. On top of all that, you will also have to pick a philosophy to subscribe to. A philosophy is not quite a faction per se, the book is more concerned with presenting it as an abstract ideology, a demonic worldview. Thematically, a philosophy will align the cabal with a penchant for either chaos or order of varying flavors. Mechanically, it will give the Cabal a blanket bonus that ties into the philosophy's theme. It also determines what devout your Cabal gets. The devout is arguably more responsible for establishing your Cabal's identity than even the leader. The Cabal wears the devout on its chest as a badge of their in-lore worldview, and the devout in turn offers very specific, and oftentimes quite in-depth, mechanics that run off the philosophy's distinct theme. You are not given customization of the Devout at the start, other than what model to run it as. But the book itself suggests that you perhaps put your Devout onto a bigger base. The recommended base sizes for the Devout are the largest of all the demon types. That is how important the Devout is, both mechanically and thematically. The Cabal's Devout is determined by philosophy, and some Devouts are more martially inclined than others. This will mean that your choice of leader will be informed by the nature of your devout, as they are often, especially in the early campaign, going to be your two heaviest hitters. This means that your initial choice of leader and devout pairing will have a massive knock-on effect down the rest of the campaign. For this review's purposes, I've gone with four different leader-devout combinations for our four cabals, and I can tell you now one of them will end up not doing so swell. The one thing, however, that draws all of these elements in, packing them in nice and tight, is the fact that there is no shooting. The verbs of the system are fight, move, and then don't move so you fight better. From the start of this campaign's progression all the way up to each Cabal's terminal game, not one single demon will ever do a ranged attack. 
This is absolutely on purpose because it makes every combat intimate. Each time your demon does harm to another, it is always with the caveat of putting themselves in harm's way. Each engagement increases the decision-making options of the other player, who will invariably do the same thing in turn as they try to murder a thing so that the other things won't get to murder more of their things, all of this in a big, happy mess in the middle of the board. Right, so it is almost 1am on day 3 of this, and I have played quite a few games already. It's an, it's an interesting system. It moves quite fast. You only play for like an hour and a half at most, maybe two hours if you're going real slow. That's including all the setup, all the takedown, all the post-game, all the post-game stuff. All the post-game stuff, which is very fun to do. I don't quite get the brokers, though. The brokers... Uh, the Tallyman, the Tallyman feels like a dead weight. I can't quite figure out how to use him yet. If you run brokers, I recommend going with a warrior leader. Go with a warrior leader. That should make the brokers work. But yeah, it's coming along. There's all kinds of things happening in the campaign. I've just started recruiting greater demons and having my base demons evolve into greater demons. And hopefully by the end of it, I'll see a few superior ones, too. As you wage your campaign through hell, the specifics of your battles will be defined by scenarios. These scenarios themselves are given further variability by the terrain you set up within the confines of the game's sensibly sized 22 by 30 inch board. The book comes with 10 scenarios to choose from, all crafted with a single goal and a binary win-loss condition. As far as I can tell, you don't draw and rain in hell, both of you just lose. Each scenario has unique rewards, and each one will have a unique way to be optimally approached. Normally, scenarios are ruled for at the start of each game, but in this campaign's case, I rigged the scenario so that I could play each one within the span of the 18 games. Each scenario also specifies the density of the terrain setup. Rain in Hell has an entire section dedicated to the rules for terrain. For this campaign, I followed terrain setup for each scenario and made liberal use of the optional terrain rules for each and every game. I know the rulebook says to use these at your discretion, but I personally advise players to make liberal use of these optional terrain rules. It adds a lot to your decision making and it gives certain demons, relics, and essences more utility. The combination of the different scenarios and the terrain randomization does a good job of providing diverse play environments. Some scenarios cater to more mobile teams, other favorite teams with strong damage punches, and other favorite teams with a good overall balance. Of the 10 scenarios available, only two of them tell you to kill a demon. The rest will run off objectives and area control. But the game isn't really about objectives. It's not like Frostgrave, which is ostensibly a looting game in which you get in each other's way. Rain and Hell may have a lot of win conditions to do with pushing buttons and standing on points, but it is really way more concerned with making the players want to hurt one another. Rain and Hell uses its scenarios and objectives as ways to pull the cabals into unique fighting arrangements. Even with the most frost gravy scenario, uh, Relic Hunters, the game still gives you two easily reachable objectives each, and then it simply implies that mugging the other cabal is the way to win. In the Twins, the scenario tasks both players with destroying one of the two objectives. Either one will do. But to destroy the objective, you need a demon to channel the power of its twin. And, oh look, the opposing cabal is trying to do the exact same thing. These scenarios are puzzles. They are, they're simple puzzles. Ones that you solve with murder. There is no non-violent out, like in Frostgrave, where you can just drag loot off the board. It leans closer to Necromunda, where the scenarios are just set dressing to the combat. And the combat, as promised in the book, is brutal. The lowest number of slain demons I had in any of the 18 games so far was 4. Each time your cabal slays an enemy demon, provided one of yours did the deed and have other demons adjacent to the murder, you'll get to roll a soul dice. In game, once you get them, soul dice may be used to replace combat roll results, or to boost a demon's movement for one activation. 
However, you likely won't be using them for these things to begin with, because souls are also your Cabal's main currency. The first thing the post-game rules ask you to do is to roll on the soul loss table for each of your slain demons. The likeliest result is the one where nothing happens. The demon's fine, just another day in hell. There is also a chance the demon gets boosted in a small way, or even rarer, in a big way. However, there is an equal chance that the demon comes out of it weaker. In rare cases, the demon could become entirely insane, now functionally useless. Or it could completely reset back to its baby form, like a Digimon. You obviously don't want this to happen to any of your demons, so the game lets you pay up with exactly one soul dice, exactly one time each per demon, to try and stop these nasty rolls from doing too much damage to your cabal. The soul loss table is interesting, because while it will hurt your demons, the chance for them to get better is also a constant. For example, one of the Panopticon's tentacle beasts, Jaw, has been slain every single game, the full 9 times, and each time he has refused to take any damage, coming back either unharmed or somehow better than before. By the end of the campaign, he was just as big a threat as any of the Cabal's leaders. The second thing the post-game rules ask you to do is to roll on the rewards table. Regardless of winning or losing, you're still going to roll on here, exactly once. If you have won the scenario just passed, the scenario-specific rewards might also grant you some additional reward rolls. Letting the losing cabal still roll on the rewards table is a measured, well-regarded decision. It shows an understanding of what makes a campaign fun and what makes a campaign frustrating. The rewards table can grant you three things. Essences, relics, or absolutely nothing. Essences are what another, less spicy system would call perks, or traits. Whenever you get one, you assign it to a demon and it is forever theirs. Each demon can hold any number of essences, but can only ever have one instance of each. They run the range from pretty good, to oh look, the entire power dynamics of the campaign have suddenly shifted. For example, around the halfway mark of six or so games, Helmet the Void Demon had lost two points of movement to Demonic Atrophy. This wasn't so bad because of his ability to teleport when he moves, along with his other special movement rules. But one game, he ended up rolling for the Essence of the Void. It gave him this once-a-game trump card of going wherever he wanted within 12 inches, and that immediately made him one of the biggest single threats in the entire campaign. Relics are equipment. They are very close in spirit to artifacts from Warhammer Fantasy and Age of Sigmar, in that they are specific things with specific names, but you don't actually need to model them onto the demons. Each demon can have exactly one relic but your demons may freely trade their relics between one another in between games. Like held items. In Pokemon, their bonuses are more grounded than essences, though in combination with the right wielder, a relic can turn a demon from all right to oh no. Once rewards are done, you move on to post-game step 4, tracking the titles. This is a familiar concept from video games, although I think this is the first time I have seen it implemented in such a way for a miniature war game. The titles are very thematic. They help so much in both the telling and the remembering of your Cabal story. Once you fulfill the requirements of a title, your demon can either opt in and take it, or opt out and lose out on it forever. Some of the titles tie into fail states, requiring the demons to die in specific ways to be able to qualify for them. An example is Unstable Steps, which gives a demon more confidence on rough and dangerous terrain once they have died on rough and dangerous terrain one time. First of all, rewards a demon with three additional inches of movement on their first activation, but only after they are the first to be slain in two consecutive games. Panopticon's leader, Woe Strider, quickly earned the title of Regent Slayer, as they were particularly good at rushing in and mincing the opposing Cabal's boss. So, I changed their name to the Strider of Woe, Slayer of Regents, and made it so they would make a beeline for the enemy leader every time, regardless of the tactical acumen of that choice. Fungicorp's leader, Monty, just as quickly took on the moniker Covetous Monty, as he had acquired three essences just a few games in. This allowed him to hold a second relic, 
he would eventually play as a very mobile objective grabber, often the first model on a relic during a hunt. Early on in the campaign, this can lead to players taking silly risks as they chase for title requirements, as if they were status-obsessed demons themselves. It is just an awesome example of mechanics tying into narrative tying into theme. If you end up having trouble tracking the requirements for these titles, consider writing down the ones you want for each demon way in advance, like at the start of the campaign. It really helps to pare down the attention you have to give the system later on. Step 5 of the post-game is the allocation of experience for advancement. Each demon gets 1 XP, full stop. If they were not slain in the battle, they get an additional XP. If you manage to win the scenario, your leader and just your leader gets another XP on top. Each demon type has an advancement track that they ascend, gaining bonuses at certain levels. Kind of like Pokemon. At certain steps, a demon will also evolve into a greater and then a superior version of itself. Exactly like Pokemon. This means that the demon gets a static stat bonus as opposed to the more variable increases and decreases of the soul loss table and the D3 variable rolls of the in-between evolution steps. The evolution stat gains make the growth of your demon knowable, but the variable increases also make it unpredictable. I am going to abruptly seg you here to bring us back to the rules for retreating. I only bring it up now because I think advancement is one of the most pertinent things it ties into. Retreating at the earliest opportunity makes sure that half of your cabal doesn't have to roll on the soul loss table. But more importantly, it makes it so they get twice the XP they otherwise would have. The book points out that retreating is most often the smart option, and I absolutely agree. Early on in the campaign, I would usually play games out to the bitter end because I wanted either side to get the bonus from winning. Really, what you would maybe get from winning usually isn't worth trading in the 3 or 4 experience you would have instead gotten from running away. This is especially the case for your leader, who makes the most out of every little bit of experience that they get. The sixth and final step in the postgame is the recruitment and expedition step where you take whatever unspent soul dice you have left and permanently convert them into regular old souls. Each dice is worth 6 souls, regardless of what you'd rolled on it. You spend souls on two things, recruiting new demons and sending out expeditions. I found that it was good practice to set aside 10 of those souls for a constant stream of regular expeditions. Regular expeditions give you a chance at an extra reward roll during the next post-game sequence, if you roll a 4 plus on a d6. That is a 50% chance. This can be a worthwhile investment in souls, as a lucky reward stable roll can get you some fancy things. Alternatively, you can pay double for a rushed expedition, giving you a chance to immediately roll on the reward stable if you roll a 5 up on a d6. That is a 0% chance. This is a risky if immediate investment and is likely meant for late game when you have an abundance of souls and nothing to spend it on. As nice as expeditions are, earlier on the most solid way to spend your souls will be to recruit more demons. Especially around game number 6, this is when your leader hits about 10 XP and when you first unlock greater demons. There are three new demons to choose from, each with unique abilities, and they're fine? If you've played any of the Fire Emblem games on the GBA, this feels like when you get a character who is already an advanced class around the time when you have a established army that already has advanced classes in it. They are useful, and it's nice to have something there just in case somebody dies, but they won't steal the show. They feel like hybrids of the lesser demons that can't do the same jobs quite as well, but can make up for it with flexibility. For example, the Panopticon eventually took on a pair of Serpent Knights. They were a great addition to the base team because they provided the speedy offense I felt Cabal was missing. They aren't as reliable on the charge as a Spine Demon, nor can they catch a charge and retaliate as reliably as a Fiend but they do have the ability to do double damage on the roll of a 6. And they did move fast enough to keep up with the tentacle beasts, so eventually they fell into their own little tactical niche. 
the Void Rogues eventually took on these manifestations of light and void, mainly because they looked real cool with helmet, but also because I felt the Cabal needed support units. I ran the manifestations as Torture Masters, because they felt like slightly slower, slightly meaner tentacle beasts. They're also a much hotter target, because the debuffs they do last for the rest of the game. King's Court and Fungicorp both ran things slightly different, going instead with more lesser demons earlier on. They would go on to be just as solid as their greater demon contemporaries, especially the King's Court recruit, Peasant, who eventually ended up with a crazy stat line and a whole bunch of kills to his name. Fungicorp was still having a hard time catching up. Their devout was still dead weight and I couldn't figure out how to use him. This was not good for them as we were closing in on the last games of the campaign. <sighs> you would think 18 games wouldn't take long. It takes really long, man. Oh uh, yeah, I quite enjoyed myself there though, despite being uh, exhausted for most of it. I did five games yesterday, and then I did the last three games today. The Broker Affiliate Demons. I couldn't quite get them. I ran a Schemer and the Tallyman. Now the Tallyman, he is not a combat demon. And you can really feel it. Because, man, he is not good to start with up until you get that first greater advancement. That's when he gets a little bit punchier. But up until that point, oh my god, he just does nothing. And you can't really take advantage of his abilities while he's still in that gimpy form. And yeah, they he could never really recover from there, and they didn't win a single game. They managed to draw once versus Panopticon. And they did manage to put up a fight, but by the end they were just like running away in turn 2 or turn 3. Felt really quite bad for them. And by the very last bit, the very last game, game 18, everybody had enough souls to buy a superior demon. The problem was only three of the Cabals had enough experience on their leaders to legally buy the superior demon. The Brokers, because they were beaten so many times, were short like seven experience, so they were just completely out of the arms race at this point. I was hinging on them like being able to buy better demons sooner because they can statistically just have more souls on them. But it just didn't pan out that way. They just ended up generating the souls so that they could pay for their hospital bills and scrape themselves up off the floor. But yeah, that's my uh, off-the-cuff impressions. I'll get back to you in a more organized way post-process. By the time I finish the last game, I am acutely aware of Rain and Hell's single greatest shortcoming. Yes, the system does have flaws, I realize I've been heaping praise onto it for most of the review, but it isn't perfect by any means. For example, sometimes when you roll on the reward tables, like all of the reward tables, you come up with nothing. Rolling for a reward and getting nothing does not feel good. Another criticism would be for the title system. Like, it's really cool, but it ends up feeling very gamey around the middle of the campaign. Each Cabal will very likely have a set of all the quote-unquote good titles assigned to the most relevant demons. It will start to feel less, less like a selection of titles to choose from, and more like a checklist to fill out. A fix for this would just be to make more titles, of course, for a more robust selection, but I acknowledge that's way easier said than done. The next slightly more nebulous criticism is to do with the nature of the games as their numbers grew. Along with the win-loss track, I kept a record of how I felt the games played out from an entirely subjective, uh, quote-unquote, balance standpoint. Early on, the matches all felt relatively even, as if they could go either way up until the last couple of turns. But later in the campaign, I found myself barely hesitating to retreat the losing cabal, retreating the losing team basically every game. There was a lot more to lose after all, the demons were now matured and powerful, so I was more hesitant to have them suffer a roll on the soul loss table, just for the sake of whatever paltry bonus the scenario win would give me. And one final thing while I'm whinging, demons with a 4-inch move 
that's uh, Porpulent and Armored Demons and the Devout for the Brokers, they tend to get left behind. Because like in a game with five activation stops, if you're spending three of those activations just moving up, maybe not even coming into contact with anything on your third move, that particular unit that does that will feel kind of, what's the academic term, useless. But of those criticisms that I have just brought up, none of them are really all that major. But the one flaw, the one flaw that Reign in Hell, the one flaw that Reign in Hell the campaign has is that it does not end. There isn't a concrete mechanical goal, as seen in Frostgrave's ultimate spell and maps systems. It doesn't have a Sengoku-style land grab system, as seen in Necromunda. It doesn't even have a rudimentary task checklist, as seen as something as simple as Warcry. I don't know if this is an oversight. The core of the system feels deeply considered and thoroughly playtested. So it is weird that the campaign not be given even a simple end point. Now the cynic in me is just assuming they will come out with more rule sets and that they will sell those rule sets and that those rule sets will possibly have the campaign endpoint. After all, that is just good business. But the mini wargaming hipster in me is saying, maybe they don't want the campaigns to have an end. At the end of my marathon run through a solo four cabal campaign, it was a genuine struggle in places. I could feel the never-ending combat these demons had to go through, being eternally ground down towards the edge of insanity as an effective, ludic interpretation of hell itself. But I am sure that isn't on purpose. At the end of it all, Panopticon, the Void Rogues, and King's Court were all riding high. It's tough to choose a winner of the three, as they all had their strengths and could easily take one another on. Panopticons, Woe Strider, Abaya, and Jaw just by themselves felt like they could take apart any other given trio of demons within the campaign. True enough, the maddest demon Abaya had led the Cabal to victory against the Beast two times. The rest of the Cabal were no slouches either. They didn't actually win a lot of scenarios, only three across the entire campaign, but by game 9 they had more than enough to recruit a superior demon to fill their last slot. The Void Rogues were the most well-rounded faction by the end, having the two toughest models in Crag and Staff. But they also had their teleporting Void Demon, Helmet, as a precision scalpel to pull out at any given moment. They also had the two meanest fiends, Tongue and Tooth, who were both rocking combat 8 by the end. They also had just enough to recruit one superior demon by the end of the ninth game. The King's Court had the most spine demons out of the bunch. By the end, they had three of them, along with two fiends and two mephits. Mephits. Mephits? They were mobile and punchy, with two very tough beat sticks running the show. Duke, their warrior leader, could easily have taken down any other demon in the campaign one on one. They beat out the Void Rose for total wins at the end, by just the one match. They also had enough for a superior demon by game 9. Fungi Corp were this campaign's runaway losers. Their build was flawed from the ground up, and I simply could not make the engine of their cabal go. I blame this entirely on their devout leader combination, as I had deprived the cabal of a truly combat capable demon from the very start. Monty is an able leader, the easy access to covetous title really helped him toughen up at the start, but he is no fighter. Leo, on the other hand, mainly pulled his weight by killing his own Cabal's demons to take advantage of their philosophy's unique mechanics. This kept them in the game somewhat, as the extra souls mitigated a lot of the poor rolls on the soul loss table. By game 9, they did have enough souls for a superior demon, but Monty was only a tier 3 leader at 14 experience, far behind everyone else who were already at or beyond 20 XP. As such, they could not have recruited the superior demon for another 2-6 to six games. Probably 6 games, since they were losing all the time. And that finally brings us to the superior demons themselves. Unfortunately, the campaign scope was not enough to cover them. I had estimated that I would get them around the game 6, 7, 8 mark, and true enough a couple of the cabals could afford them at that point, but nobody had yet hit tier 4 at 20 XP to be able to legally recruit them. 
And honestly, I don't think I'm missing much in terms of campaign analysis by not fielding these demons. The Shadow King and Lord of Flame in particular look to be quite dangerous, but just looking at their stats and looking at those of my current leaders, the Vouts, and now greater level starting demons, I feel they'd have to play a bit of catch-up before they could hold their own in the same way the veterans do. If I were to get a Venom Queen, for example, regardless of which Cabal took her, the other Cabals would have an immediate counter to something with 13 HP and just the 5 combat. The Void Rogues, for example, had at this point rolled two additional essences of Void and could have easily taken on any given superior demon. Easily. Now, this isn't an indictment of superior demons. If anything, it is praise for how well they have balanced their demonic Pokedex or how well they have balanced their demonic bestiary. Superior demons are a choice. You either take the gamble on something that might be devastating or you... Take the risk earlier on and build up a lesser demon over an extended period of time. It's decisions. It's interesting decisions, and I quite like that. To wrap everything up, I played the solo campaign for 18 matches across four different cabals, each cabal fighting the other a total of three times, clocking in nine games per cabal. That is 36 discrete points of view involving all 10 of the available scenarios at least once. I ran with full campaign, scenario, and terrain setup rules, following them as best as I could manage. By the end of game 18, I got to what I would describe as the start of the late phase of the campaign. Now, 9 games actually isn't all that much from a wargaming perspective, especially since the playtime average for Rain and Hell is about 1 hour and 30 minutes, closer to 1 hour 45 once you're deeper into the campaign. And that's including setup and postgame. Mind you, I was playing solo, and I did not take into account the usual social things like speaking with your opponent, getting a drink, going to the bathroom, stuff like that. So my data will definitely be a little confounded. Translating all of this to a more traditional wargaming schedule, if in a campaign of Rain and Hell, I would recommend playing with at least two other players, and playing once a week, aiming for two games each session. That's about as long as a Warhammer game played in a tournament -y manner. And I expect most people are used to playing for that length. Also, try and utilize the terrain rules as much as you can. They make the game so much more interesting. Two games a week for five weeks gets you to ten games. At this point, you would have reached where I ended the solo campaign, and I expect the campaign would maybe have six more games, or three more weeks in hell, before it starts getting old. This is not an indictment of the system, by the way. I think most campaign systems will get old around the two-month mark. At around 15-ish games, you would have to consider making a homebrew finale to your campaign. My own personal recommendation would be to run a King of the Hill game with as many people as can fit in it, while also running the special rules for Hellstorm. Have it go on for as long as it takes up until there is only one demon left standing on the hill. This setup will take most of the evening, but it is a great way to cap things off, taking full advantage of the rule set's fighty strengths while prioritizing narrative and spectacle. Run that finale around week 8 or 9, and after that you got yourself a full-blown campaign experience. I am confident in saying that you will enjoy your time with Rain and Hell, as it is out of the basic book. It is absolutely worth the purchase. I'm also pretty confident in saying that there will be more ancillary rules to be released, so holding off on purchasing and playing for the time being is also a good call. Rain in Hell is currently one of the only systems to run off the compact 22x30 board size that also provides a robust hobby and campaign experience. The system is tight, the matches are terse, and the rules are easy to learn. The game's unique theme ties very well into the mechanics and the emergent narratives those mechanics create. It is great for close-knit groups, ideally of 3-6 to six people, and it is very generously priced. I think the ideas within it alone make it worth a purchase, but more importantly, I think it is worth the play. Thank you very much for watching, and I do encourage all of you to go to hell.